to talk to you not about the apprentice's duty to the lodge but the lodge's duty to its apprentices we have a duty of care to these brethren we brought them in to something weird and wonderful if you don't have a strong supportive relationship between the lodge and its apprentices you will not keep them effectively the lodge from the Shaw Statutes of 1598 has had a responsibility to train its apprentices and normally it would appoint two well-versed and well-skilled brethren to look after it those were usually the proposer and the seconder now we've added a different office to that we've added mentors but their role is to tutor you and teach you the lodge takes on a responsibility when it takes on an apprentice and for the last 500 years since the very beginnings of Freemasonry back in the Lodge of Aberdeen in 1483 we've successfully educated our new members about the ways and practices of this ancient order and we intend to draw your attention to the three great principles that Freemasonry is braced on these are brotherly love relief and truth brotherly love is our social side relief is our charitable work but the one thing that makes us really different is our study of truth over the last 20 or 30 years Freemasonry has come up with new problems these are mainly about recruitment and retention how do you recruit somebody if you go out to them and say we're not going to tell you anything about what we do we're not going to tell you where we meet we're not going to tell you why we meet what our intentions are if you join we'll tell you more it's not really a sensible proposition up to the 1980s if you look at the statistics we didn't have a lot of trouble finding candidates mainly because families would propose their younger members to join lodges had waiting lists it could take 20 years to reach the chair to go through all the progressive offices from Tyler through to Passmaster but now it's different in the modern day you can uh, Google Freemasonry and you will get some wonderful and outrageous sites to look at you could go to Ron Castle's exposure of the cult of Freemasonry you could find out who really runs the world you could even find out if you can join and become a mason online they're all absolute nonsense but they're all there and present there's lots of scare stories about Freemasonry for instance I didn't realize I was a member of the Illuminati and part of the Magic 12 until I read Lynn Picknett's book about it I'd never quite realized you could easily be scared away by anti-masonic fright stories or you could be attracted for the wrong reasons perhaps you do want to rule the world and you think Freemasonry will teach you how to do it we do attract some candidates through our peculiar form of internet dating it's not quite like tinder but if you do swipe right you'll get taken through to a site that will provide your information to a recruitment officer but you find that often the candidates we keep join us through a personal interaction with existing members we need to address the way society has changed if we're going to survive for another 500 years we need to think about how we exercise our corporate responsibility as a lodge to train encourage and cultivate our new apprentices how do we implement our duties of care how do we inform prospective candidates about our purposes and how do we explain what we're doing to our entered apprentices because it's very confusing social media Twitter Facebook websites books that's one I can recommend if you don't know anything about Freemasonry newspaper articles that's one I wrote for the Independent during the uh, anti Masonic campaign or a TV series that's the Forbidden Histories one that I did with Jamie Thixton they all work but in my experience the best way to secure lifelong Masons is by lodge open nights invite prospective interested gentlemen 
to come along to a social evening, preferably one they can bring their wife as well. And when they're there, tell them about what we do. Give them a little talk about the purpose of Freemasonry and what it's about. And then, if they're interested, they can be encouraged. Simply asking a potential new member to ask for initiation is only the beginning, though. We've then got to grow and inculcate a lifelong interest in our craft. And that's the purpose of my talk today. When Freemasonry began, back in Aberdeen in the 1480s, there was no formal education of craftsmen. They weren't even literate. But they were aware that symbols are incredibly powerful. Symbols can convey meanings that words can't. Symbols, when displayed in public, can change the way people think. And, if you learn the basics of how to take a rough stone from the quarry, carefully shape it, build it into a wall, you can build a beautiful temple. And whenever Freemasonry talks about building a temple and taking a rough ashlar from the quarry, it's talking about you. You are building the temple of your own character, your own personality, your own soul. And that's what Freemasonry is about. We are the oldest spiritual, philosophical, self-help society in the world. We're not a religion, we are a philosophy, but we're a philosophy that studies the nature of truth. And we realize that any individual has different views on truth, has different beliefs. We forbid the discussion of religion and politics in our lodge, but we ask you a key question. Do you believe there is a source of order in the universe to study? If you hadn't believed that, we wouldn't have brought you into Freemasonry. Because Freemasonry is asking the big questions. Why are we here? What are we for? What is our purpose in life? And if you don't think there is any purpose in life, what's the point of us trying to help you and bringing you together with lots of like-minded people who you can share your ideas? The traditional way was that training takes place in working groups, in lodges. It would be demonstrated by a master, a piece of work. And then, under the supervision and guidance of that master, the apprentice would copy it. And then, this took the form of a legal relationship between the apprentice, who undertook to study and learn, and the lodge, which undertook to train, teach and improve. Our traditional way of teaching is an apprentice would first become a journeyman. He would receive instruction in the basic ways of working as an apprentice. He would learn to use the mallet and the chisel and the 24-inch gauge to measure his work. And he'd also been told that these are tools that we moralize and turn to building our own character. 24-inch gauge, the 24 hours of the day. Get a proper work-life balance. The, the chisel the cutting sharp edge of education and the mallet, the driving force behind the chisel that actually lets you take a rough stone fresh from the quarry and shape it into a perfect cube to fit into a building. And when they develop sufficient skill and prove their understanding of the work, they would become masters in their own right. So a craftsman would work for a master, eventually he would become a master himself and would employ his own apprentices and pass it on. Now that's a model that Freemasonry has used via its proposers and seconders even down to the 1980s and then we seem to lose track of it. In recent times it seems to have largely fallen into disuse. It does seem to be a view that you can rely on the provision of online material with little personal interaction between the apprentice master and their charges. It's not true. We've instituted an office of mentor, but it's largely a collar office. And often the mentors don't take on the role of tutoring the entered apprentices. So we've lost that intensely personal relationship between the master and their apprentice. And it's a deficit that I identified 20 years ago. And I'm going to tell you some of the ideas I've explored and used, and I'm going to suggest to you to follow. In 2000, I wrote a book called The Book of Hiram. And in it, I wrote a little piece which said, Freemasonry is dying. I'm going to read it to you. Freemasonry 
is dying. For most people, life is far more complicated than it was just a generation ago. We work harder and have more disposable income. Long-term commitments are usually avoided at all costs. In an age when employment comes packaged and a series of renewable contracts, and even marriage is out of vogue, it's not surprising that men no longer queue up to sign on for a lifetime of acting out oddball rituals in a local hall with no windows. A candidate for the craft is expected to enter a lifelong relationship with a lodge before learning what Freemasonry is. They're given no advance warning of what they will be expected to do or what benefit it will be to them. So it's little wonder that Grand Lodges throughout the world are having difficulty selling a proposition that does not meet any of the normal criteria of a marketable product. While most Freemasons are happy to admit their membership, some prefer to keep the whole matter private. And in the face of prejudice in the workplace, others find it necessary to sometimes deny that they are members. The impression of secrecy that surrounds individual Freemasons is largely brought about by their embarrassment in talking about the nature of our rituals that in the cold light of day sound very odd, odd in the extreme. If asked what such strange rituals are all about, they often confess they don't know. I've come to believe that the compelling reason for silence among Masons is not so much a compulsion to adhere to their sacred vows or fear of macabre retribution from their fellows. If Freemasonry is to continue to survive, let alone thrive, it's important that new members learn about all aspects of Freemasonry, including the one thing that makes Freemasonry unique among fraternal associations, its study of truth. I wrote that 20 years ago, and ever since then, I've been puzzling as to how we can pass on the beauty and wonders of our philosophical system to a next generation. And the view I've come to is no point in trying to compete on the basis of how much we're giving to good causes. That's not our purpose. <coughs> giving to good causes is something we feel the urge to do because of what we learn about truth. We don't exist simply as a charity to collect funds. It's a byproduct of what we do. Yes, we do contribute to lots of things. It is worthwhile, but it's not our purpose. Our purpose is to develop in our apprentices an understanding of the nature of truth and an understanding of themselves so that they can build their character, their personality, their soul. We use very ancient teaching methods. We use ritual. And you will be amazed at what you can memorise. But in doing so, rather like London taxi drivers who do the knowledge, you'll find certain parts of your brain will grow. And you'll find it easy to memorise other things. And you'll learn about symbolism by being exposed to symbols under quite trying and extreme circumstances. For instance, you were exposed to symbolism when you approached the lodge, hoodwinked, dishevelled, naked left breasts on display, when the inner guard poked you with a sharp point and said, do you feel anything? In some Yorkshire lodges, the ritual actually says, do you feel a prick? But what you were being taught was not to be too impatient and rush ahead before you were ready for knowledge, or you would impale yourself on the dagger, but also not to run away, because you had a noose about your neck, which would have strangled you if you'd run away. That's the first symbolism. You were learning to face your fears. You were learning to trust that even though you were blindfolded and in the dark, the lodge would guide you. Teaching these methods has got to be done face to face with the apprentice. And you need a Masonic tutor. It can be your proposer, it can be your seconder, it can be your lodge mentor. But they need to demonstrate, advocate and explain what's going on. Simple things. If you arrive late, tell the tiler. He will tell you whether they're in first degree. If they are, he'll make a report, he'll bring you in, and he will guide you on how to address the Worshipful Master. And you'll take the step, you'll make the sign, and you'll say, Worshipful Master, I apologise for my late arrival. 
And the worshipful master will say, please take your seat in the lodge. Easier. It's this personal interaction and willingness to answer questions that's the basis of training an entered apprentice. And you shouldn't rush an entered apprentice through their degrees before they've learnt the previous one. Freemasonry is based on three grand principles. Brotherly love, relief and truth. And the lodge with its formal meetings and social events demonstrates and teaches brotherly love. We're quite good at that. The charity stewards who will approach you rattling collecting tins and covenant forms and will run regular promotions for particular charities will teach you how to carry out your duty of relief. But it's down to each individual member of the lodge to teach our apprentices how to approach and understand the nature of truth. So to become a master mason, an apprentice has to be encouraged to continue to seek knowledge. When you first came into the lodge and you took your oath and you stood before the worshipful master, you were asked a question. You were asked, what is the principal wish of your heart? And you were told to reply, light. Whenever Freemasonry talks about light, it's talking about knowledge. So by seeking light, you are seeking knowledge. And you're told that to take a rough stone and shape it, you need the chisel of a sharp, pointed education and the force of the mallet of conscience to drive it to shape the stone. The chisel is representative of education. And today, I'm offering you the chisel of education for you to accept. And I'm encouraging the senior members of your lodges to make sure that they offer you this in full. So eventually you can stand in front of a tracing board and understand its symbolism. As an entered apprentice, you should make daily steps in Masonic knowledge. The reasons for this, education shapes your intellect, it expands your mind, it broadens your perspective, and it makes you a more civilized human being. We take good men and make them better. And the Masonic method of shaping and squaring a rough ashlar into the perfect platonic shape of a cube is necessarily a slow job. You can't rush it. You need to learn caution. You need to measure and check before you apply the hammer. Because once the chisel bites into that stone, that stone is changed forever, for good or bad. Make sure it's changed for good. So the key to success, develop craftsmanship. Craftsmanship in Freemasonry involves thinking about your motives learning your ritual, understanding your symbolism, and thinking, what does this mean for me? What can I learn from this? Take a pride in your work. You're going to have to learn your test questions before they'll let you become a fellow craft. So practice them in a lodge of instruction. You'll get them wrong the first few times, but you'll suddenly find it's automatic. What's important is that every little step, every small chip off the rough ashlar to reveal the perfect ashlar within it, no matter how small or how apparently oddly shaped, it's important in building this overall temple. You need to make daily use of your chisel of education so that you are understanding something new every day. But what do you need to learn? That's where the role of your Masonic tutor comes in. The personal engagement of a Masonic tutor will explain and demonstrate the philosophical methods of Freemasonry and encourage you to develop knowledge and understanding. It involves three areas. You must learn how to memorize and deliver ritual. You've got to learn the duties of each office of the lodge, because eventually you will go through them all. And you've also got to understand why it's important to study truth and how you set about it. So I would suggest there are four steps to successful Masonic tutoring. The first one is make your apprentices welcome. Celebrate them. They're your future. Don't ignore them. I, when I joined many, many years ago, I had no clue what it was really about. And uh, at the very first meeting when I was initiated, they gave me the test questions and answers. And I'm a physicist by trade, so I immediately said to my proposer when I came out, out of the lodge, why have I got to recite the Galilean heresy before they'll let me become a fellow craft? Because you have to admit the earth goes round the sun and not the sun round the earth. 
That would have got you banged up in prison in the 1600s. It did for Galileo. So I went along to John, the senior past master, and said, why do I have to recite the Galilean heresy before they'll let me become a fellow craft? And he said, shut up and keep learning your ritual. <coughs> There's an answer to that question, which in due course, if nobody else gives you, I will. You've got to explain the symbolism of the ceremony to an edited apprentice. They've only seen half of it. You've got to present a description, a full description, of the tracing board. And you've got to engage the apprentice with all the lodge members before you can hope to pass them as a fellow craft. Because if they haven't done those basic tasks, they're not ready to become a fellow craft. Let's look at each of these in turn. Make your apprentice welcome. At the end of the ceremony, make sure a senior member of the lodge, proposer, mentor, worshipful master, even the minder in some cases. Incidentally, the minder is a senior provincial officer who comes and sits next to the master to act as the liaison between the provincial office and the lodge. And he's called the minder, usually. I don't think that's his formal title. He's probably called a representative. But all the lodges call him the minder. So he might do it. In fact, I, I attended an initiation at Excelsior Lodge in Salford just the other week where uh, the, uh, the Grand Officer made the welcome. And it's an address of welcome which explains what the ceremony was about and helps you understand it. It can be done in Lodge or it can be done at the festive board. It could be possibly done as part of the ritual of conducting the apprentice's chain. You've got to explain the symbolism of the initiation ceremony. So at the very next practice or lodge meeting, you need to deliver a lecture to your apprentice explaining the symbolism of the ceremony that they've just gone through. And you've got to do it very soon after the ceremony. Because that's when you want to know. That's when you're interested. That's when you're ready for that knowledge. We describe you as a rough ashler fresh with the quarry dew. And if you work a rough ashlar when it's fresh with the quarry dew, it works easily. If you leave it outside for six months to dry, it cracks and fractures. You've left it too long. So you need to do it quickly. You need to explain the tracing board. There are formal lectures on the tracing board. Some lodges have got very good ritual descriptions of the tracing board. If you do a full tracing board description, it introduces you to lots of characters in Freemasonry and the way in which it works. The entire board has a meaning. So ideally, when you've had the description of the tracing board, your proposer or your lodge mentor should give you a photographic copy to put in a hidden folder on your phone so you can look at it when you want to and think, what does that really mean? Because don't try and put the symbols into words. Look at them and think, what does that mean to me? What do I understand from this? How does it make me feel? Putting it into words, you restrict it. Because words can only walk into your mind in single file. Symbols can come in line of rest, and a whole idea can come into your mind fully formed. If you've got a brother who can deliver the ritual of the tracing board from memory, treasure him and use him. If you haven't, make sure that somebody reads the ritual out to the apprentice when he stands in front of the tracing board and points out the relevant parts of it. Next, you've got to meet all the lodge members. You've joined a lodge. You probably know at best two people, your proposer and your seconder. What are the rest of them? All dressed up in fancy clothes and collars, waving boxes about, carrying poles, wandering all over the floor. What are they doing? You need to meet the rest of the lodge and you need to find out what they all do. My suggestion, which I've found to work extremely well, is that if you ask a candidate to carry out some very simple tasks, and I'll tell you what those are in a moment, then they will meet individuals. One of the tasks is to find out who's the oldest past master in the lodge, go up to him, introduce yourself, and ask him, why do you still bother coming to Freemasonry after all this time? And just see what he says to you. I've created a series of simple tasks for an apprentice to carry out which will help them learn about their own lodge. A Masonic tutor's role, the proposer, seconder or mentor, has got four 
clear areas of responsibility to the entered apprentices. It should introduce him to the joys and pleasures of visiting. You ought to do it as soon as possible. The sooner you start visiting, the better. You've got to learn about brotherly love. What do we do to support each other? What do we mean by brotherly love? What are our social aims? You've got to learn about relief. How do we support charities? Why do we support charities? Which charities do we support? But most importantly, you've got to learn about truth. And truth is taught by storytelling, the myths that you will enact through the various degrees of the craft. And that's why it was so sad to hear how the story has been fractured. Because the story actually goes first, second, Mark, third, and then Holy Royal Arch. And in Scotland, you always used to take it in that order. And when you do, you'll find the whole sequence makes sense. When you do it out of sequence, it's like doing a jigsaw without the picture on the box. The other important thing is make sure that you celebrate your apprentice's progress. They don't necessarily have to do all the ten tasks as suggested before they pass to the degree of a fellow craft, but if they do, they'll learn a lot and they'll benefit. And the sooner they carry them out, the better equipped they will be to become long-term masons. The aim is that you should award certificates. So when you've done one of each of the tasks from Brotherly Love, Relief and Truth and gone on a visit, you can have a certificate from the Junior Warden in Open Lodge. And when you've successfully done two tasks from each of them for Brotherly Love, Relief and Truth, you can go to the Senior Warden certificate. And when you've done all ten tasks, the Worshipful Master will mark your achievement and say, well done, Brother Apprentice. Let's talk about the tasks that you would need to do. All Masons can visit other Masonic lodges. It's one of the great joys of Freemasonry. You can go along and you can watch how they do it and you can say, well at least we do it properly, they do it different. Because they all do do it slightly different. Go out and see them. Once you've realised that wherever you are, you can visit a Masonic lodge, all you have to do is contact them and you've got friends everywhere. Your first and most basic task is to visit another lodge. Now your proposer or seconder will have friends in other lodges, so you can ask them to take you on a visit. You need to follow the dress code of the lodge. It's probably a dark suit, a white shirt, black or provincial tie, white gloves. You don't need an apron. The tiler of the lodge you are visiting will provide you with either an entered apprentice or a fellow craft apron, as, as the need be. You need to be able to give your lodge's name and number, but if you go with a proposer, seconder or mentor, they'll vouch for you, so you won't need to prove yourself. From doing this task, and then discussing it with your Masonic tutor, what did you learn from it? What did you notice was different? You and he will both learn something about visiting. And the mentor gets as much out of it as the apprentice does. Then, tasks on brotherly love. Attend a social event at your own lodge and think about how you enjoyed it. What was it about? What was its purpose? Just reflect on it. You can either write a few thoughts or you can just discuss it with your tutor. The main role of the tutor is to make sure that the apprentice has done it and has understood it. And any questions you get about what should I do? You know, if I, if I visit Penman Hour Lodge and I discover that they give fire and the first fire is, is three times eleven, do I panic? Or do I simply count eleven and keep clapping three times eleven? It generally flummoxes the visitors. Some lodges do much more simple fire. It doesn't really matter. Go and visit them and you'll find that you can learn to do it as well. Talk to your oldest past master. Ask him why he still enjoys his Freemasonry. Speak to each of the main officers in the lodge and ask them what they do. What's, the, what's their purpose? Deacons carry messengers. Who from and who to? Talk to them. Ask them what they do. And when you do, ask your questions of your mentor. Basic tasks on relief. Find out who the lodge almoner is. Talk to him, ask him what he does. Why? What's his purpose? Find out who your lodge charity representative is. Talk to him. Ask him what he does for the lodge. And finally, go on your provincial website and find out what a festival is and why festivals matter and how they're carried out. But it's the tasks on truth which are the one thing that make us different. And they're the most important. 
So the first thing to do is attend another brother's initiation, either at your own lodge or at another lodge. If you do it at another lodge, you can combine the task of visiting with the task of seeing an initiation. You missed a lot of it because you were hoodwinked and blindfolded. See what was really going on when you couldn't see. Learn and deliver your test questions in a practice lodge. Nice safe environment to get it wrong. You can even have a crib sheet when you're first starting, although it'll get taken off you in due course. But practice, so that when you go in, you've been rehearsed in that, and you know full well you're confident in doing it. And then read or listen to a lecture on the first degree tracing board, and make notes about what you think it might mean, and discuss those notes with your tutor and raise the questions. A few closing thoughts. I think we need to approach the critical issue of how we pass our love of Freemasonry on to the next generation. And we need to do that by taking care of our apprentices. And to help that process, I've actually decided it would be useful to write a series of Masonic Tutor's Handbooks. Because, as I said to you earlier, I think the reason that some people are afraid of this task is because they do not know the facts. I put all the facts together in a little booklet. There's a reading lecture on the symbolism of the first degree. There's a complete tracing board description, taking the best from all the ones that I've seen from different constitutions and different lodges. There's a series of photons of Masonic light explaining different things like how you're welcome and the meaning of the northeast corner, the meaning of the peculiar moment. And there's a series of tasks to do which will help mean that you know your lodge. Not lodges in general, your particular lodge. Now I'm going to give these to your care. I want you to take it. <coughs> Don't read it yet. Okay. Pass it to your Masonic tutor. Ask him to deliver it to you. And then get him to give it back to you so you can revise it. And that way, you'll have gone through each of the steps. The lectures don't have to be given in a lodge, because the lodge will get bored with hearing the same thing over and over again. They can be done in a practice night, but they need to be done. But don't read them yourself. You will get far more from it if an experienced master reads it to you. So I'm trusting you not to read ahead. Have you all got a chosen Masonic tutor? Is it your seconder, your proposer, your seconder, yeah. or your mentor? Yeah. Pass it to them, tell them that you're lending it them because you want it back when they've done it, and ask them to carry out the four steps to guide you. Thank you, brethren. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.